I'm Freeman Rabowski, president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I had the privilege of chairing the National Academy's Committee on Underrepresentation in Science. So let's look at what that means. The fact is that the demographics will tell us that in this country, the population is shifting dramatically. In fact, the proportion of underrepresented minorities in science and engineering was less than a third of their share of the overall population. And the fact is at every level, we'll see that kind of underrepresentation. When you look at the college age population or the K through 12 public enrollment, you see that almost 40% of the public enrollment will consist of minorities. About a third of the college age population will be, uh, will be minorities. And about a quarter of those in college are these underrepresented minorities. However, when you get to bachelor's degrees, you see that it's about 17%. And by the time you get to the doctoral level, only 5% of the doctorates are earned by people from underrepresented groups. Now, two points that are really important. We're working in our country to increase substantially the proportion of students who have either a, a AA or a bachelor's degree. And right now, you see that for these minorities, these underrepresented minorities, African Americans, Native Americans, and Hispanics, the percentages are 26% for, for blacks and 24% for Native Americans, and only 18% for the fastest, fastest growing population in our country, Hispanics. Uh, even more significant, however, uh, some of you may remember that in the Rising Above the Gathering Storm report, uh, the recommendation is that we move from 6% of the bachelor's degrees going to people with natural science and engineering degrees to 10%. Well, for minorities who are representing an increasingly large percentage of the American population, the problem is much worse. You see here that fewer than 3% of those groups, uh, as a rule, when you put them together, will have earned degrees in natural sciences and engineering. What's even more surprising to many people is that while only 20% of blacks and Hispanics who begin with a major in these areas will graduate in these areas, the fact is that for whites it's only 32% and for Asians only 42%. So we can say that for Americans in general, fewer than a third of those who begin with majors in natural sciences and engineering will graduate in those areas. Hello, I'm Mike Summers. I'm a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And since 1994, I've been an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. You just heard from Freeman Hrabowski about the uh, educational disparities that exist in the U.S. and how important it's going to be for us to educate a more diverse workforce in science and also more diverse leadership. One of the things my friends and colleagues often ask me is why aren't there more minorities interested in science and math. And it turns out that this is a misconception. If one looks at the college board data for more than 10 years now, similar percentages of African Americans are starting college with an interest in science, engineering, and math. And the problem is that few are retained. Uh, retention is a big problem, and that's one that we've been focusing on at UMBC as part of our Meyerhoff Scholars Program. Uh, so this is just showing you one of our recent graduating classes of senior Meyerhoff scholars. This is a strengths-based program. It focuses on high achievement. Uh, we uh, focus also on community building, and that's one of the things that makes this program a little bit different. Students are encouraged and taught how to work in groups in a supportive way, not to segregate into the high-achieving groups and the uh, groups that are struggling more, but to intermix to make sure that they will all be successful as a, as a cohort. And then finally, we try to get the students into labs as soon as possible, typically after their freshman year. And so I'm just showing you this is one group of seniors that graduated from my lab one year. Uh, these students had 12 publications. One paper was in science. Three of the papers, the, the students were uh, first authors. And, and uh, three of the papers were featured on the covers of the journal. So these students are not just doing back burner science at UMBC. They're typically involved in high-end research working side by side with the graduate students and postdocs. And there are large numbers of students. This just shows some of the students supported by our HHMI grant. Uh, these students have gone on to the very best graduate programs in the U.S., including Stanford, Hopkins, Case Western, Michigan, Baylor, Columbia, and other top programs. Uh, we've been keeping track of our performance. Uh, the program has been in place now for more than 20 years. And when we set it up, we uh, set metrics and standards, and then we measure them. And we've got a number of publications now that, 
talk about our performance and the changes that we've had to make in order to keep the, the program uh, successful. So since it was opened in 1989, we've had more than 1,000 participants and more than 800 graduates. Interestingly, 92% uh, of the students that have joined the Meyerhoff Scholars Program have graduated with a science or engineering or mathematics degree, and 65% of those graduates have matriculated directly to uh, graduate school. Uh, an additional group has gone to medical school, but that, the numbers that are going to medical school are, are, are quite small. We've had over 100 African Americans earn PhDs, and an additional 31 earn MD PhDs. So the top producer of African Americans who are going to earn MD PhDs. We've got a lot of students who are enrolled in graduate school, and in fact, for the past couple of years, uh, about 15 African Americans who've earned PhDs in the U.S. earned their bachelor's degree at UMBC. Now, uh, when I started my faculty position, I was, like, like most of my colleagues, motivated by science. I, I love discovery. And even when I wake up in the morning these days, uh, the first thing I think about is the experiments in the lab and did they work. And, and I can't wait to get in and see what's going on. But uh, a couple of years ago, my grandmother passed away. And I was sitting in my office thinking about um, what I would do if I knew I wasn't going to be around tomorrow. And I realized that I probably wouldn't sit and reread my science papers, but I probably would sit down and reread the papers and emails that I've gotten from my former students. Uh, education and mentoring is such a rewarding part of what we do. And it's terrific for me to be part of a program like this. So Freeman, you know, I go to science meetings, and at the end of my talk, I put up a, a slide with the students in sure, my lab. And it's sure. a very diverse group of undergraduates who are doing research. Yeah. And, and scientists will come up to me and say they wish they had the pipeline that I have, yeah. you know. And how do I do it? And I say, well, I do it because I have Freeman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, people probably really want to know, how sure. does the program work? And sure. what are the key ingredients, in your opinion? You know, I, I start with an understanding of the students' backgrounds. You were just talking about quality of preparation. We need to know those skills that are most critical for any student, regardless of race, to succeed in science on that campus. But secondly, since we know that two-thirds of students who begin in science don't end up graduating in science, we really have to look at the most fundamental approaches to helping them succeed. The first would be performance in the first year of work. You need students to get a solid foundation in biology, chemistry, mathematics, physics, engineering, and I would say that means with a grade of at least a B. So how do you do that? Because mm -hmm. I get uh, an undergraduate who will come into my office mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of her freshman year, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she'll say, Dr. Summers, I want to do research, and mm -hmm. I'll look at her and say, all right, well, what's your GPA? Well, you know, I have a 4.0 after my freshman mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. now, Who's going to turn that student down? Right. You know, I want to do research. I want to get a PhD. Right. I have a high GPA. Right. Right. These kids are coming in really well prepared. Right. They're excited about science, but they're academically re you know, ready to go. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're taking a, a typical freshman who's sure. learning how to sure. study sure. 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 and sure. has to kind of figure that out sure. before they get involved in research. How do you get sure. them so prepared so quickly? Well, you know, I, we have focused on group work getting students to work together. We now have the course redesign. I think redesigning courses in that first year, more emphasis as we have in our chemistry discovery center on collaboration, use of technology, understanding what students are understanding and what they're not. So it's, it's and also helping students understand just how hard they have to work. Nothing takes the place of hard work, right? right? And so the course redesign and having the group work and collaboration together can make a big difference in getting students with at least Bs in those courses. And the other point is that as I go around the country, in most institutions, bright students really don't want to say they need help. They want to believe, I can do it by myself. But if you think about what we do in science, obviously people learn to work together. We can all help each other. So changing the culture so that people know they really can get some help and, they, and that help can make all the difference. Even for our chemistry discovery center, uh, go beyond that, chemistry tutorial center. The fact is students don't come to the, to the tutorial center to pass. They want to get A's. They want to be the best. And, that, and so changing the attitude and ideas about tutoring and working together can make a big difference. Yeah, you know, you talk about changing the culture, and I have to tell you a story. I don't know if you know about this, but I talked to a senior colleague who said that if that person had a black student in their upper level science right, class, right. they would sit in the back, they wouldn't ask questions, right. and if they made a C, yeah. this person would write a very strong recommendation letter yeah. and they probably went to medical school. Yeah. 
But he was very against doing something for uh, a particular group of mm -hmm. students, whether it was based on gender or race. Mm -hmm. And uh, about five years later, we had a visitor to campus, and this person was telling the visitor about Meyerhoff. And he said, you know, now there are large numbers of minorities. They're sitting in the front of his science class. Right. They're asking the hard questions. And now, if a black student makes a C on his first exam, he calls him into his office <laughs> and wants to know what the problem is. And I don't know if he gets it to this day that his expectations right. change. Exactly All of our right. expectations sure. change. Sure, because about we're what seeing we expect. It. That's exactly what we expect from the students and what we expect from ourselves. That's I, right. I like telling people it takes researchers to produce researchers. It, so it's great to have staff supporting these efforts, but when faculty get involved themselves and they know whether well, the students are doing well in the courses, and then when they pull them into the experiences in the labs, it can make all the difference in the world. You know, I think you should talk about the model you use for having undergraduates doing substantive research after the freshman year. Yeah, well, in, in my lab, you know, we have large numbers of undergraduates. The undergraduates, when they come in, they have to work full-time in a summer. Mm -hmm. They have to work full-time two summers in a row, and they have to be in the lab during the intervening academic year at least three days a week, three hours a day. And by being in there initially during the summer, when they're not taking any classes and don't have any other outside jobs, uh, they develop a good working relationship with the grad students and the postdocs. They're, they're full time over the summer, and so they can be really well trained by the time classes start. And then when classes start, undergrads are very independent. Sure. You know, I think the most important point we can make is that it's possible to have Meyerhoff replicated in other places. It just Absolutely. takes people who care and to focus on the students and their ability and, and to make sure that they're getting that solid foundation, both in the classroom and in the lab.